Okay, any questions from the oncology section we covered last time? You guys are all oncology experts now. I can expertly pick out side effects and drug interactions and all kinds of stuff, right? I'm sorry? Of course I'm going to do that to you guys. So, um, we're going to do a review after we get to the Durham section. So I'll probably just, um, this section isn't super long, so I'll probably just kind of power through and, and get to the review. Um, so if you guys have any uh, burning questions, uh, we'll talk about them then for any of the, the previous sections. So, Okay. So um, do kind of an introduction to uh, dermatologic pharmacology. Um, there's a lot more to do with dosage forms than you would see in some of the other uh, disease states we'll talk about. So um, lots of different variables in, in trying to figure out what kind of pharmacologic response you're going to be seeing to, to topical drugs. Um, we know that, uh, do you guys remember we were talking about fixed law back when we were talking about uh, absorption of drugs back in pharmacodynamics? Mm -hmm. What did fixed law really tell us? The thickness of the membrane has a lot to do with this. Okay, thickness of a membrane is really important for, for passive diffusion, right? This is not really an active process, it's all passive diffusion that's occurring. So the thickness of the membrane is really important. So if we were to apply this to, you know, these drugs to a thinner membrane, you'd have more absorption. more absorption, right? So what are some areas that might have a little bit thinner skin? Oh, all these ones that are listed right there, obviously, yeah. So especially um, if you see like uh, interogenous areas where you know skin on skin kind of contact, that's also going to help with absorption as well. What are some other things that are affecting uh, drug absorption through the skin? Surface area. Surface areas, right? So uh, the bigger the surface area, the more absorption you should get. What else? Hmm? Yeah, that kind of goes back to the the, the um, thickness of the membrane, right? So if you have like if you're giving it to, like a really like like the bottom of your feet, obviously much more you know tough you know callous skin. You're not going to get a ton of absorption versus if you were to put it you know in the in the axilla or somewhere like that. Yeah, so that that can be important. Um, specifically, though, looking at like kind of the the physiochemical properties of it, just how lipophilic it is. So obviously, things that are more lipophilic will have better absorption. Someone have a hand up. pH could be affecting it. So certainly, like looking at the charge of the drug, um, that could be affecting the ionization state of it. And things are obviously that are not charged, things are going to be more um, lipophilic. They might have an easier time getting absorbed. So that certainly would have a, a, an impact on that. Most of the times, the drug's already kind of formulated to be at the, kind of the, the proper pH for that. Um, so we said surface area. We said you know physical chemical properties of the drug itself. We said you know thickness of the membrane. Anything else? Temperature. Or Sweating. That's interesting. Temperature is an interesting one. I'll come back to that idea in a second. So concentration is the other big thing, right? So the bigger the concentration gradient, the more absorption you have. So if I put a bigger concentration on the outside of the skin, you're going to have more flux or more drive to push that drug to an area of lower concentration, which will be um, in the skin and then into the systemic circulation. Heat's kind of an interesting thing because you can actually end up increasing penetration of certain drugs um, if the area is heated. So for instance, um, has anyone uh, heard of the drug fentanyl? Right, so it comes in a patch form, uh, and basically it's an opioid analgesic. You can apply it as a patch and, and provide some um, kind of long-acting pain relief. And so there's actually been um, really significant um, drug interactions, I guess not drug interactions, but environmental interactions where if you heat that pad or heat the patch, it'll actually speed up the dispersal of the drug and, and increase absorption. So say you know you're having you know chronic back pain or something, put one of these patches on. Uh, then I decide to go sit in the uh, jacuzzi uh, in order to help ease some of that pain. Uh, all of a sudden, I stop breathing and, and die. Right? Not good. Um, <laughs> But it's happened before. There's been cases uh, of that actually occurring to people. So it's a really good, you know, patient education point. Like, hey, um, you know, be aware of those kind of interactions and when, when that's appropriate. So it doesn't happen for every drug, but the fentanyl happens to be one of those ones um, where you can see that. Uh, you can also roll them up and smoke them, but I definitely would not <laughs> recommend that to anyone. <laughs> Anywho. Um, so again, so concentration gradient is going to be important. So um, especially when we're looking at things like uh, corticosteroid resistance, oftentimes you can overcome that by end up increasing your concentration of drug. So that's why you end up seeing a lot of preparations of, of these different uh, steroids. will actually have a lot of different concentrations of the drugs. So you might see hydrocortis of 1%, 1.5%, 2%, and as it kind of goes up, because you're going to get a bigger dose uh, absorbed based on increasing that percentage. So uh, yes? How great of a temperature change do you need for that to become severe? For the fentanyl? Yeah. Hard to say because it's going to be kind of on a spectrum. So obviously the hotter you get it, the more absorption you're going to have to a certain degree. Um, but yeah, like I said, you can see significant respiratory depression even someone going into, you know, fairly hot water in a jacuzzi. If you're sitting in a sauna or something like that, you can probably see similar effects to that. So, so if you're playing like basketball in 100 degree weather, like on black 
our pavement like in florida during in july yeah i don't i'm not sure i haven't heard of that that case where that's happened before but um yeah it's all on the spectrum so hopefully we would not have that but just if you, get, if you go to really extremes of heat that's where you're going to see that issue pop up but good good question um so dosing schedule can be affected by the type of uh, uh dermal uh, topical product you're going to be using so in a lot of cases you may actually see the skin kind of act as a kind of a reservoir for the drug so um just because the the drug is in the skin does not mean it's actually where it's a true site of action you know it still takes time for it to be absorbed to the systemic circulation so that's why it's good that you can actually have uh, once daily dosing for shorter acting drugs because you have that continual absorption of the drug through the skin um, again that's also why the onset of action is typically going to be faster or slower than say um you know an intravenous med should be a lot slower, right? Because it takes time for that that uh, penetration through the skin to occur. Obviously, the thinner the skin, the more flux you're going to have, the easier, or the more, uh, quicker onset of action you're going to see with that. So, vice versa uh, for thicker skin. So, um, and then also looking at uh, vehicles and occlusion. So, occlusion is basically kind of the staying power of, of the dosage form on the skin. How long is going to be sticking around for? Um, this can, you know, you can see lots of issues with the vehicle changing uh, the permeability of the drug. So, kind of like we talked about with pH, it also depends on how hydrophilic or um, uh, lipophilic the drug is in the kind of... Uh, the solution that you put it in. So we'll see different um, compounds will have, uh, you know, different types of emulsions. We have water and oil emulsion where it's more primarily an oil-based compound you're dealing with versus uh, oil and water, which is going to be more water-based. And that can really affect what type of dosage forms you can put your drug into because the solubility might be changing pretty dramatically based on that, um, based on the oil to the water content. And so um, you'll see that different content or different dosage forms will have both moistening or drying effects. And we'll see, you know, a lot of uh, dosage forms will have alcohol uh, content to them. And we'll see that, that can have a big uh, effect on drying. So we'll get some, uh, some comparisons of those. Um, and just the vehicle itself may be therapeutic. So if you imagine if you're having, um, you know, significant itching, you know, related to say, you know, uh, dermatitis um, and you're putting on these creams, like, you know, not only is the, the steroid that you're putting on uh, going to be helpful for the disease state, but also just the, the cream itself you're applying um, can have a kind of a, a soothing effect on the skin. So that can be therapeutic. Um, and then again, occlusion can increase the both the efficacy and the toxicity. So if you ever will have you know something that's applied dermally and then have some kind of dressing put over it, what is that going to do to absorption? Increase. Should increase it, right? Anytime you make something more occlusive, the longer the contact time is going to be with the skin, the better absorption you get. So I probably mentioned it before, but I ever mentioned um, the uh, we had a poisoning case where um, an infant who um, was having some diaper rash. And so the dad was a chronic pain patient and they went to some compounding pharmacy where they were able to make this um, uh, this cream for him that had all kinds of different products. And it had uh, you know some TCAs, a tricyclic antidepressant compounded into it, had ketamine, which anyone know what ketamine is? A horse tranquilizer, basically, yeah. So it's it's a, a very powerful sedative, um, but yeah, certainly used for horses uh, as well as people. But it had you know some ketamine uh, compounded into it, so all kinds of different products, right? And so you know, mom didn't know any different, so she said, "Well, here's some cream. Let me just slap it onto the baby." Um, so it was right after a bath, so the baby had this nice hot skin, so that increased you know blood flow and absorption of the drug. Um, then we also put it you know onto where the kid was having diaper rash, which what do you put on after that? put on a diaper so again that uh, increases that occlusiveness and so next thing you know mom puts the kid down for a nap comes back kids apneic um that's called 911 goes into the PICU and uh ends up doing fine um need to be intubated for, you know for probably 12 hours or so but ended up doing fine after that and they were able to do measurable levels of some metabolites of ketamine after that just to show that the kid was having pretty significant absorption so just be aware that occlusiveness can increase toxicity if that's not what was really the, the original intent right So again, um, some consideration for these dermatologic vehicles. So again, this is kind of the uh, what you're putting the drug into. So it could be the cream, the ointment, whatever it happens to be. Um, so you're looking at drug solubility. So obviously the drug needs to be soluble for it to actually go into solution. Um, now anything that it can be used to hydrate the stratum corneum can actually enhance the, the penetration. So we'll see different things be more drying, th other things be more hydrating. That can help to increase penetration of the drug. And then also you have to consider the stability of the drug. Because anytime you're putting drug into an aqueous solution, you're going to make it inherently less stable uh, from a chemical perspective. So that's why you know tablets have a much, usually have a much longer um, shelf life than you would see with something like an aqueous preparation for drugs, just because there's some inherent instability there. Um, so that's why we add in a lot of different um, excipients to the products in order to help increase that, that shelf life, you know, things like preservatives and, um, uh, you know, antimicrobial compounds and, and things like that to make sure the, the stability of the drug and the sterility of the product stays uh, intact. 
So if you're looking at um, the different dosage form you might want to try based on the type of patient you're treating or type, what type of skin you're trying to, to uh, apply it to, um, things that are you know, oozing, having any kind of crusting and things like that, you may want to use uh, products that are going to be more drying because it can help to dry that skin out. So usually you're going to see things that have uh, a higher water content to them or say a higher alcohol content potentially are typically going to be more drying. Right? Whereas if I'm going to uh, apply it to very dry skin, you see you're seeing some scaling, xerosis, things like that. You can use more occlusive products that have a higher uh, fat content or higher oil content, and that's actually going to be a little bit more hydrating. Um, so this is where you're going to see uh, kind of a better staying power for the drugs too. So you have things like your ointments and creams versus things like you know lotions are going to be much more water-based. And I'll show you some comparison charts in just a second. Um, but just keep in mind the type of skin you're applying the vehicle to and making sure that that's going to be compatible with the vehicle that you're using. So if you're looking here, you can kind of compare a few of the different dosage forms. So if you're looking at, say, an ointment, which an ointment, if you had to kind of um, you know, consider this to be the most occlusive, it has like kind of the most staying power, um, this is going to be more of a water and oil uh, emulsion, which means that the oil component of it is going to be kind of the, pri the primary uh, component. So if you look at the, the solubilizing medium, less than 25% water, so it's important you have something um, that the, the drug is actually going to be soluble in that. Um, notice here it's going to be a, a, a providing that protective oil film on the skin, which can be useful if you're having a lot of, you know, uh, skin drying is going on there. Um, but you're also going to have issues of, you know, it leaves a nice greasy feeling, which is, you know, usually not something your patients like so much. So just keep in mind the, the, the various um, comparisons here and how one might not always be appropriate for every single patient. Does that make sense? Notice that the more water um, that you're going to be putting into the compound, so if you're looking at get a cream versus an ointment, um, you typically you're going to need more preservatives because of the fact that as you increase the aqueous uh, content, you're going to be increasing that instability of the, of the actual chemical compound. Okay, so the first thing we'll talk about is going to be acne. So uh, we know this is going to be a pretty multifactorial disease. And have you guys covered derm yet for CMS? Okay, so this will at least be a kind of a preview for that stuff. Um, Basically, when we're treating acne, we're going to be f targeting kind of four different um, kind of pathophysiologic uh, pathways. So one of them is going to be this increase in sebum production. Um, when you have that increase in sebum production, you're going to be having this alteration in the uh, keratinization process, and you have this uh, hyperproliferation of the, the ductal epidermis. This is going to make things pretty uh, favorable for uh, this bacterial colonization with this uh, per uh, propionibacterium acnes. Um, and then when you have that, when you have that infection occur, that's when you're going to have a lot of inflammatory mediators starting to be called up. You're having an, an uh, inflammatory response to this, and that's where we see a lot of the, the inflammation happen um, with the actual skin itself. Lots of uh, contributory factors for sure, so like environmental things, so you know, heat and humidity. Obviously, we have both of those uh, in adequate supply here in Florida. Um, you can see pressure or friction can be inducing this as well. So if you imagine, you know, young hormonal teenagers having you know, helmets or shoulder pads on, things like that. Um, Certainly the seasons uh, can sometimes get better in the summer, worse in winter, depending on the type of patient you're dealing with, um, and even physiological components like stress. So if you have a lot of increased glucocorticoid secretion from the adrenal glands, that can uh, increase your risk for developing um, acne. Because if you look at like giving systemic corticosteroids, that again, one of the side effects could be acne from that, right? So same thing's happening here. So again, looking at the um, increased sebum production, you're kind of creating this nice anaerobic condition where the, this bacterium can now start to reproduce, uh, uh, and then you're going to see this inflammation occurring. So here you see this uh, increased keratinization, usually due to lipase coming from the bacteria. This can work to hydrolyze the you know, triglycerides into free fatty acids, so that can lead to that. And you end up seeing a lot of um, you know, cytokines and things like that producing pus. You know, so that's basically where you're seeing these comedones come from. Um, and you can kind of have non-inflammatory versus inflammatory um, conditions, but we'll look at mainly treating them as kind of one, uh, one holistic bunch. So we'll see um, that the different drugs we're going to use are going to be looking at treating different components of this pathogenesis. So here you can just kind of see the, the processes that will be um, going along. Um, really just noticing that foreign body response is where we're really going to see a lot of the inflammation come from and we get the nodule, the cyst that can develop. Okay, just a nice picture here, kind of showing you uh, the process where you have those, you know, sebaceous glands just increasing that sebum production, and then you have the eventual um, actual comedone uh, forming there. Okay, 
Um, certainly you can also have uh, drug-induced acne, which can be a significant side effect for certain medications. So it's important to be aware, uh, you know, when you're doing your history to make sure you're you're doing a good medication history to find out uh, if this any of these drugs could be a potential um, a cause for this. Because obviously, what would you want to do to, if you, know, if you found a drug that was causing acne for your patient, what would you do? Either decrease a dose or maybe find an alternative drug to use, right? So it's important to be able to at least uh, find that out to say, hey, you know, maybe, um, you know, sometimes you can't get away with that. Sometimes you need to treat through uh, the drug because it you know, would be necessary for, um, you know, especially if you're looking at something like tuberculosis, you know, probably want to end up treating that. Um, so you have to do kind of a risk benefits analysis um, looking at the, the drug you're using um, versus kind of the, the side effects. So um, certainly systemic corticosteroids are going to be one of the biggest bunch. So people who are on these chronically, um, especially those that have, you know, autoimmune uh, conditions that are very inflammatory in nature, so like rheumatoid arthritis and things like that, that are on chronic long-term systemic corticosteroids can be more at risk for this. Um, you can see a lot of uh, inflammation, especially on the trunk. Um, typically, you see anywhere between two and six weeks after initiation of therapy. So this is, wouldn't really be for you know your patient who's on a kind of a pulse dose of steroids for asthma uh, by any means. And fortunately, you see less risk of this with something like hydrocortisone. It doesn't really have as strong of uh, glucocorticoid effects as you'll see with some of the other drugs. Um, some like prednisone certainly could do this, dexamethasone. Um, and what's interesting is if you actually were to remove the corticosteroid effect, because typically corticosteroids do what to the immune system? You just suppress it, right? So if I end up removing that suppression, all of a sudden um, you have all these other kind of, um, you have those, uh, you know, the increased semen production, you're having um, that abnormal keratinization, you're having those bacteria start to produce. Now your, uh, you know, inflammatory system starting to come back online after you remove those corticosteroids. Now you can actually have an initial worsening of the inflammation. So that's one of those things you can see where you think you would take away the drug and things would get better, but it potentially can get worse at first and then uh, potentially clear up. Yeah, you typically wouldn't see that unless you're using a, because again, when we're applying uh, topical steroids, you can definitely have systemic absorption, right? Especially when you're using higher concentrations, more occlusive um, products. If you're using um, things that have a higher potency, you're more likely to see the systemic effects. So it's not to say that it couldn't happen with uh, topical products, it's just less likely, especially if you're using like normal over-the-counter hydrocortisone cream, right? Very, uh, very low probability for that to happen. You think so, but then you're having all those other kind of, you're still having those bacteria starting to reproduce there. You can't really do anything um, to get rid of those, right? So um, you're kind of dealing with one problem, but you're still leaving all the others to, to treat. Uh, some other drugs that we can see uh, as common causes of drug-induced acne include, like we mentioned, the tuberculostatics. Lithium can be a big one. So again, lithium we see used in, in bipolar disorder um, some, with some frequency. And then certain and, uh, anti-epileptics. We'll talk more about those uh, next semester. Um, but those can another, uh, be another big source for drug-induced acne. So uh, the treatment, uh, when we're looking at this, the goals of therapy is to realize, one, this is a chronic uh, condition. It's going to require early and aggressive treatment. And then typically, uh, once you kind of get down to back to your baseline, this is going to require maintenance therapy for, for some time until uh, the patient either grows out of it or potentially they could have it for, for very long periods of time. Um, we want to reduce the number and severity of lesions. Uh, if we'd like to slow the progression of the signs and symptoms and help to prevent um, any kind of recurring exacerbations and also prevent any kind of long-term physical scarring and things like that, uh, and hopefully avoid some psychological suffering because it's hard enough being a teenager you don't want to have a lot of acne to deal with in, in uh, as well being called pizza face is no fun as i know from personal no, i'm just kidding um i was just a fat kid that's all i didn't really have bad acne um so anywho uh so looking at the treatment again um the target we're going to be looking at these microcomedones and if we can deal with the um that follicular occlusion um we can help to kind of inhibit the further process of that cascade. You saw they all kind of feed back into one another. Um, we're going to see both a combination of pharmacologic and non-pharmacologic therapies in order to help treat this. We want to use multiple mechanisms of action to help target multiple steps, right? Because it'd be nice if we can just use one drug. That'd be um, preferable. But in a lot of cases, you'll see we'll use multiple therapies. And it's important to use multiple mechanisms in order to help target those different steps. Um, for the most part, if you're using mild to moderate disease, if it's not very extensive, you can get away with topical therapy, which is preferred because we limit a lot of side effects. Um, otherwise, for more extensive disease, you know, if it's covering a large portion of the body, if it's moderate or severe, systemic therapy is going to be preferred. And so we'll kind of see uh, a little bit later on, basing on the, the staging of, of the acne, you'll see different uh, bits of stepwise approaches uh, that we'll take to that and in regards to what type of medications we're going to use. 
because we have like some really big guns we can use to really arrest the acne, but unfortunately, it's uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, pretty significant side effects that go along with some of those drugs. We'll see why you might want to avoid those for uh, the majority of our patients. Uh, so, as far as non-pharmacologic therapy goes, you know, cleansing is going to be uh, important. You know, using soaps and detergents and you know these surfactant systems can help to disperse and remove a lot of the fat and the oils from the skin surface. It's important uh, that there has to be a kind of a balance between you know cleanliness and also uh, too much drying and irritation. Because sometimes um, when you remove those fats and oils from the skin, you're also going to increase uh, the drying that's happening there, uh, which can lead to its own irritation and inflammation. So um, soaps are not always going to be the best products necessarily. We'll see that, you know, one, once they're ripped off, they're not really going to have any kind of long-term effects on the skin. So, uh, and then you can also see that due to their pH typically being higher because they're soaps, um, they may actually degrade some of the activity of other agents, right? So you can actually see some other products being inactivated by that pH. Um, so again, it's important to wash the face, but just make sure not to do it too frequently. So maybe like twice a day. Um, you know, some patients may be more sensitive to that than others. Um, but just you know, there's uh, good things in moderation, not to go too little, too much. So uh, topical therapy, the important thing to remember here as far as caveats go is that one, it's only gonna work where it's applied to. So, uh, you know, if you are having very extensive disease, it can be very difficult to apply a drug to the entire you know site where, where the acne is occurring. So uh, yeah, that's why you may lean more towards systemic therapy for very extensive disease. If it's just a face, that's easy enough. Uh, but if it includes, you know, a lot of the trunk and, and the chest and the back, like that can be very difficult to apply a drug to that whole area without causing uh, either, you know, side effects or uh, just being very difficult to manage uh, from the patient's perspective. Most of these are going to cause skin irritation. So again, that's why with the cleanliness, you know, we don't want to make sure we're cleansing too often because again, that's also going to lead to irritation. Um, in a lot of cases, you'll see that this will lead to patient discontinuation because of the, the skin irritation. Um, in order to help avoid this, we're going to go as low a strength as uh, possible with their products and then gradually work our way up to see what they can tolerate. Um, and then by using non-alcoholic based solutions, um, hopefully we'll kind of limit how much drying will be occurring to the skin as well, which can lead to further irritation. So most things, start low, go slow, and kind of titrate it to see how the patient is going to tolerate it. So here uh, is just a kind of a nice picture. It shows you how the different drugs are going to be working on different steps of these. You'll see certain agents like antibiotics are going to be helpful for dealing with the actual bacterial infection. Um, you can see other ones are going to be uh, better for helping with like abnormal keratinization. Some are going to work with on the actual sebum production. Notice that on the sebum production side, you see a lot more on the side of steroids um, that are going to be important here. So we'll see where those kind of come into play. Um, I think we'll start off with kind of the easiest therapy and then kind of start to go up stepwise from there. So first thing would be benzoyl peroxide. I'm sure most people have been a teenager at some point and have used some sort of product of, of benzoyl peroxide. Um, this one itself is working by helping to penetrate the stratum corneum, so it's at least soluble enough to do that, uh, unchanged, and then it's able to get converted over to benzoic acid. So this is good because benzoic acid has activity against uh, P. acnes, and it also will have this um, kind of peeling and comedolytic effect, so it helps to get rid of uh, some of the comedones there. Uh, again, start with a low concentration because this is going to irritate the skin. So say 2.5% once daily, and then you can increase your frequency or the concentration based on how the patient is tolerating it and based on how the symptoms are responding to that. Um, you'll frequently see it in combination with other products. You may see it in combination with, say, topical erythromycin or, say, clindamycin. Um, and as far as adverse effects go, again, uh, skin irritation is the biggest thing, but can also bleach your hair, can bleach clothes, so it's you know, important to make sure that um, you know, especially if they're putting this one on like a nighttime or something, um, you make sure it's not touching any clothes or it can have any prolonged contact with it and things like that. So just be aware uh, that the bleaching can occur. Similar to benzoyl uh, peroxide is going to be this, uh, azelic acid. Um, this is just going to be kind of a straight chain um, dicarboxylic acid. And we think that it probably works kind of similarly to benzoyl peroxide, um, but it also is thought to have some ability to kind of inhibit this conversion from testosterone to dihydrotestosterone. Uh, when we get to the endocrine section next semester, you'll realize that dihydrotestosterone or DHT is a much more potent androgen than testosterone is. So by inhibiting that conversion, you're going to see less androgen effects. And we know that androgens are going to be pro-acne. Um, so by inhibiting that effect, we can hopefully limit um, how much acne is actually developing there because of that. Uh, again, start once daily, you can get increased to twice daily uh, as a patient can tolerate it. Um, and really here, the, the only adverse effect again is gonna be the skin irritation. Um, you'll typically see that it'll start off 
kind of worse in the beginning, but over time they will get kind of used to it. Say over six to eight weeks with continuous therapy, it should start to die down a little bit. Okay. So if you're, you know, say benzoyl peroxide, this azelaic acid is not really working, this is when you can start stepping up therapy to looking at some of your topical retinoids. So um, retinoic acid, otherwise known as tretinoin, is going to be the acid form of vitamin A. Um, we're not really sure completely how it works uh, for treating acne, but it is seen to help deal with uh, correcting some of that follicular keratinization that's occurring there, that's abnormal. Uh, can help to reduce P. acne's counts and reduces uh, the actual inflammation that's occurring. So all kind of good things for treating acne, even though we don't really have the full idea how it works. Um, when you have first-line uh, non-inflammatory acne, can be used as a, uh, used as a first-line drug, um, and frequently you'll see it used with other combination therapy. So benzoyl peroxide is nice because it's an over-the-counter product. They can try that out on their own. Um, you know, by the time they're coming to you for therapy, they may need to already step it up to something like uh, a topical retinoid. And uh, you may also see these being used as well for things like wrinkles and dispigmentation. Um, all of these are going to be uh, prescription-based products. Uh, interestingly enough, if you ever go to Nassau on a cruise, uh, my wife was super excited and we went to one of the local pharmacies because uh, they actually had Retin-A that was uh, over the counter. I was like, you don't have any wrinkles. And she says, it doesn't matter. That's how I prevent wrinkles <laughs> in the first place. Okay. Um, so then looking at the adverse effects, uh, again, this is going to differ based on kind of the strength of the retinoid that we're going to be using. Uh, obviously, it's going to be going up uh, from here, so we'll start with kind of the basic one. But um, erythema, desquamation, burning and stinging, obviously, is going to be um, seen with less frequency the more you're using the product as your body kind of gets used to it. Um, also, using emollients or things like um, um, other types of, I'm trying to think of the word lotions and things like that that can help to um, kind of hydrate the skin. That's going to be useful to uh, help to kind of rehydrate it and prevent some of that burning and stinging happening there. You will also see photosensitivity when you're having the drugs on board. So um, be aware that they can have severe sunburn. Make sure they're using uh, high SPF sunscreen, especially you know, here in Florida where there's lots of sun. Um, and then also you want to avoid during pregnancy because any of these vit vitamin A, um, uh, vitamin A kind of, uh, try that out totally lost for words today, but any congeners of, of vitamin A, um, they can really have adverse effects on, on fetuses, so generally avoid these in, in pregnant patients. Um, tretinoin is kind of the, the first one. Uh, it's the most basic. This one's actually photolabile, so you want to apply this one at nighttime, because otherwise if you put it out in the sun, it's going to degrade over time, uh, so it's not going to be too useful. And then actually by combining this one with the benzoyl peroxide, which is you know common to use these two classes of drugs together, um, that can actually inactivate it. So again, it's important to let them know that make sure there's uh, enough time in between applying the drugs that you're not going to have one inactivating the other. So some other ones uh, we'll see being used include adapalene or differin. This one is actually stable in sunlight and stable benzoyl peroxide. This might be a better drug for your patient since it is more stable. Uh, it tends to be a little less irritating. Uh, and then moving on up, you have like uh, tazerotene. Uh, this is actually a third generation agent. You'll see that as we move along, these can be used uh, for other kind of inflammatory conditions. So things like acne uh, and psoriasis. Um, sometimes you'll see these used with topical steroids as well uh, for certain inflammatory conditions. And then you have allotretinoin, which can be used to treat uh, Kaposi sarcoma. Where do you usually see that at? HIV AIDS. Yeah, HIV AIDS. Um, and this uh, bexerotene uh, can actually be used to treat some uh, types of lymphoma. So lots of other causes, um, uses for this um, than just using, treat, uh, treating acne. Uh, some of the topical antibiotics you can see uh, used as well. So common ones are going to include uh, clindamycin, erythromycin, sulfacetamide, and also metronidazole. Um, all these are going to have good activity against uh, that P. acnes. Um, so any of these would be pretty much um, useful to, to a similar degree. Um, you know, if one product is not really tolerable to your patient for side effect reasons or whatever, they can try switching over to a different one. Um, but really, any of these could, could potentially work. Okay, so let's say you've tried your topical products or say you're dealing with a patient who has very uh, extensive disease. Uh, what can you do at that point? Um, this is where you get into more systemic therapy. So one of the first uh, systemic drugs we'll talk about are these systemic retinoids. Um, so if we said the topical ones, we should avoid in pregnancy just because you do get some systemic absorption. These ones you definitely want to avoid in pregnancy. Um, so this one's going to be isotretinoin, it was known as Accutane. Uh, this can be effective you know, for treating very severe acne uh, within one to three months, um, but it's absolutely contraindicated uh, in pregnancy and breastfeeding. And actually, men should be avoiding this as well if they are sexually active uh, to prevent, because they can actually have some transference of that and can lead to some adverse fetal effects. Um, has anyone heard of a, of a RIMS system for a drug? 
So RIMS is this thing that the FDA mandates for certain drugs that have very significant side effects. And so it stands for Risk Evaluation uh, Management Strategy. Uh, and so basically, actually a uh, mitigation strategy, I apologize. Um, and so they put out different drug uh, programs out there to make sure that patients are being properly screened uh, and are using proper protection when using certain types of drugs. So something like um, clozapine, which is a uh, type of antipsychotic, um, falls in this category, but uh, they have this iPledge system for isotretinoin. And basically what it means is that the patient has to be registered with iPledge, the physician or the provider has to be registered with iPledge, and the pharmacy has to be registered with iPledge. And basically what they're doing is to make sure that one, the proper pregnancy um, tests have been done, make sure their patient's not pregnant, and then also they've been educated to make sure they're using appropriate protection, usually at least two forms, so say you know oral birth control and um, some kind of barrier protection uh, to make sure you don't have any kind of negative uh, effects on any kind of fetuses that might develop. So very, very significant. Um, you know, this is why I usually reserve this one to more um, very severe or more extensive disease, just because it is a lot more labor intensive to get someone enrolled in this drug. That makes sense. It's because it's like severe deformities in the fetus, correct? Yeah, or just fetal death. Yeah, it would be pretty bad. Yeah, so like I said, anytime you're monkeying with like you know, vitamins, uh, especially in the development of a fetus, it can be pretty significant. So this is no exception to that. So changing around uh, you know, vitamin A uh, can be have big negative effects on the fetus. So um, this one is definitely going to cause a lot of uh, skin irritation. Um, again, so you're kind of doing that risk-benefit analysis. Okay, you don't have any acne anymore, but now your skin's super fried um, from taking these retinoids. So kind of looking at uh, those trade-offs there. Um, you get this retinoid dermatitis. So you can see that erythema, pruritus, scaling. Um, again, they're going to be more photosensitive, so photophobia can happen. And you can even get things like you know, alopecia, brittle nails. You see negative effects on serum lipids. Um, and also, you can actually see some CNS changes that can occur. So one of the big things you're also monitoring for is um, increasing size of depression. So it's important that you kind of, kind of assess your patient at baseline and follow them up afterwards, or if they already have depression, uh, maybe from the acne, um, that this is not going to be getting worse with this drug because, again, it can lead to increased you know, um, symptoms of depression, risk for suicide, and things like that in, in at-risk patients. So you can see why we kind of hold off on using this one until they kind of failed most of the other therapies first um, because it is very potent, but there's a lot of side effects with it. And then you can also use systemic antibiotics. Um, the place in therapy for this is more going to be for patients who have more extensive disease um, or if it's difficult to treat. So say, for instance, you had a patient who had, say, acne just limited to the face. If they failed multiple topical therapies, you can try moving on to a systemic uh, uh, antibiotic. Or if they have just very extensive disease, you may start off with a systemic antibiotic, right? So it just depends on your patient and kind of where you're at as far as you know the, the extent of their disease and what they've tried previously. Uh, most common ones you'll see being used include tetracyclines. And remember who our contraindications for tetracyclines are? Children, Children less than? Eight. Yeah, eight, right. So, um, so hopefully they've not really gotten to a point where they're developing a lot of acne yet, but those would be the ones to avoid. Um, you know, doxycycline, minocycline, all very cheap, and, you know, very available um, to use there. Um, and pretty safe and effective for the most part. And then you can also use potentially um, uh, trimethoprim sulfacetamide might be another product you can see being used. But very frequently I see the tetracyclines used most commonly. So some other therapies that may be used. Um, salicylic acid uh, is uh, typically something you'll see used uh, more as a keratinolytic. So uh, very frequently you'll see it used in a lot of like wart products in order to help kind of uh, kind of break down that, that tissue there uh, to break, you get rid of the wart. Um, they use it for many years, but there's not a whole lot of studies to support use in acne. Um, so it probably won't be recommended all that too frequently there. Um, using certain antiandrogens, so we saw with that azelaic acid that inhibiting uh, androgens can help uh, decrease the uh, severity of acne. You can potentially use something like spironolactone. Uh, they actually can compound a uh, gel product um, that will can be useful for that by decreasing the activity at the androgen receptors. Uh, where else do we see spironolactone being used? As a diuretic. Does it provide mortality benefit for anyone? Might be on your test in two days. So like later stage CHF patients um, actually get some mortality benefit from um, uh, spironolactone. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, and then for certain patients who are um, they're more prone to it. Uh, oral contraceptives can be useful to kind of help regulate um, estrogen and progesterone levels in, in, in women. Um, so very common ones you'll see include ethanol estradiol, uh, norethindrone, eth with a com um, along with ethanol estradiol. We'll talk more about that in the next semester when we get to um, more of the endocrine uh, drugs. So if you put a patient on um, Accutane, could you give them oral contraceptives as well to make sure they're not getting 
it'll get double benefit. Yeah, they frequently they're going to be prescribed both. Um, it depends on your patient. You know, um, you know, for one, if they're you know adamant and you're kind of believing they're not going to be sexually active, that you there's less risk of that. You're still going to do the pregnancy test. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, there you certainly could be patients who are on both. Yep. It's like they get the additional benefit out of the oral contraceptives. Yeah. So much the better. Yeah. Exactly. Um, for some patients who have uh, individual these in big inflammatory nodules, you can actually sometimes see uh, intralesional steroids being used or just injected right into the lesion. Um, you can see some systemic absorption and some local tissue atrophy, but that's going to be more on a case-by-case -case basis for those patients with those uh, inflammatory nodules. And then um, Sometimes oral corticosteroids can be used, but this would be pretty exceedingly rare. Um, sometimes you can see low-dose therapy can actually reduce symptoms in patients who have adrenal hyperactivity. Why do you think that would work? Because corticosteroids do what to the adrenal glands? Tell them to shut down, right? So anytime I'm exogenously providing corticosteroids, the adrenal glands are going to start to be inhibited, right? Because they're already sensing them getting more corticosteroids than I need, so it may be able to tamp that down a little bit. Um, and so for patients who have a really significant inflammatory disease, sometimes a short course therapy might be beneficial to them just to de decrease uh, a lot of that uh, inflammation that's occurring. But again, this is going to be more on a case-by-case -case basis, not used very commonly. So looking at here, um, you don't have to memorize this entire slide, but just looking at the different types of acne, you can see kind of your increasing severity and extensiveness of the disease as you go through the different types. Um, and just be aware of the kind of suggested options for how to, to treat this, right? So, you know, for more mild disease, especially early on in therapy, you can consider topical retinoids, you know, plus or minus benzoyl peroxide. Um, again, get a good history of what they've already tried, what works for them, what is you know, not really tolerable to them based on skin irritation. Um, and then basically you're just going to be following up with therapy and seeing how they do. If they fail therapy, if they get worse, then you just go ahead and step it on up, right? So say in the first um, option there, you see a topical retinoid is a drug of choice. You can add benzoyl peroxide. If that's not working, then maybe you could step it up and add on either a topical or potentially an, uh, a systemic antibiotic, right? So that could be another, the next option. Once you're kind of done with those and you're kind of on to systemic therapy and that's still not working, that's when you want to consider um, systemic retinoids, right? But again, remember that's going to be a lot of side effects associated with that, um, more so than any of the other uh, topical or systemic therapies. Does that kind of make sense? So you're starting one therapy, seeing how it goes, seeing how they can tolerate it, and then you can either try increasing the dose or the frequency of administration, or if it's still not working, then add on an, potentially another drug, right? But just make sure you're doing you know, kind of a stepwise approach so you don't add on two at the same time, and then one of them worked, but you don't know which one at that point. How much time do you have to give each step in order to see if it's responding or not? It could be, of course, like a month or two, I would say, you know, um, to make sure you're getting the full effect and also to give the side effects a chance to kind of die down a little bit. Because it could be, you know, initially you're just like, oh man, I can't deal with the skin irritation, but then, you know, over the course of a week or two, it gets better and more tolerable, then that might be okay for your patient. You know? So it's going to be very, very individualized based on your uh, individual patients. So any questions on that? Okay, uh, next thing we'll talk about is atopic dermatitis. Uh, we'll kind of use this as a, an umbrella for many different in, you know, inflammatory skin conditions other than acne. So um, this is where we're gonna talk a lot about our uh, topical steroids as well. So uh, it's a common skin disease, you know, uh, lots of different forms of it. Um, you can see that it's really mostly related to kind of an autoimmune kind of condition. You're just having these allergic reactions. Um, that's occurring here. Uh, and you'll see that the skin barrier dysfunction is playing the major role here. So um, a lot of the drugs we're going to see being used uh, not only are going to work uh, at the site to deal with that inflammation, but they can also um, be therapeutic at the skin itself. Um, for one, helping to prevent, say, contact with any of the allergens or may actually be therapeutic to the skin itself to help, you know, kind of reinvigorate it a little bit. So um, some major indicators for atopic dermatitis include things like pruritus, rash in areas that are typical for the disease, um, you know, family history of it, things like that. And you might have some minor indicators as well that are, um, uh, you know, not all inclusive, but could certainly be pointing in the, uh, this direction. So uh, obviously we want to provide some symptomatic relief. Uh, if we can identify and eliminate any triggers that they know they're being exposed to, that would be definitely a good thing to, to get rid of. Um, prevent any kind of future exacerbations and then getting it down to the therapy, hopefully to prevent uh, a lot of side effects coming from it. So this is where we're going to see us tailoring our therapy based on where the actual uh, inflammation is occurring. Um, it's going to you know, kind of indicate what types of concentrations and types of drugs we're going to be using. Um, and then having any secondary skin infections, uh, we want to be able to treat that as well. 
So looking at non-pharmacologic therapy, lots of things you can do to help prevent um, some of these symptoms of this dermatitis. So for kids, especially using things like lukewarm baths, applying lubricant after after bathing, keeping their fingernails short. Um, sometimes by giving them an antihistamine at nighttime, um, that can help to decrease the itching. It also kind of helps them to kind of go out and go to sleep anyway. Um, a lot of these kids will end up kind of scratching at nighttime, so you can end up seeing you know, a lot of um, uh, skin irritation, bleeding, things like that from, from a lot of the nighttime itching. Um, you know, try different uh, distraction techniques. Um, and then really the big thing is identify and remove any of the irritants or allergens that can be identified. And just maintain good hydration as well can help. So uh, basically the topical steroids are gonna be the gold standard. Um, the choice of the agent is really gonna depend on both the severity of the disease and the site where it's gonna be at. So typically what we're gonna see is that because we know that the skin is gonna be an area of kind of thick or thin skin, of the face? Yeah, pr pretty thin. So you want to typically use low potency steroids for this. And we'll, I'll show you a table in just a little bit that um, we'll talk about the different types of, of uh, low, medium, and high potency steroids. Um, so again, low potency are gonna be good for the face. Uh, they're better for long-term therapy because again, they're gonna have the least amount of systemic absorption and the least amount of side effects uh, seen systemically. Um, for the you know large portion of the body, you can use the medium potency steroids. And then for uh, you know, some more significant exacerbations, uh, you may potentially use medium to high potency corticosteroids, say like a medium at a higher concentration uh, or a high potency steroid. And then typically what you'll do for these exacerbations are use a higher potency steroid uh, for say one to two weeks to deal with that inflammation. And then you can switch back over to a lower potency steroid, right? So looking at their adverse reactions, typically the reactions are going to be systemic in nature and they're going to be all related to the potency, duration, how uh, large of a body surface area the body we're covering, and the inclusiveness of the preparation. So more occlusive, more absorption you're going to get. Um, so here you can see local skin uh, atrophy, you can see increase in acne, which we kind of were talking about uh, previously, uh, allergic dermatitis, it can actually be related uh, to the vehicle itself. So if you actually see a worsening of the dermatitis when applying a steroid, it could be related to that. Um, and systemically, all the things we've talked about previously, so you know, adrenal suppression, secondary infections, hyperglycemia, uh, cataracts, all those things uh, that we're kind of used to as we've seen uh, systemic corticosteroids used previously. So looking at uh, our different potency of different steroids, you can kind of see here that uh, hydrocortisone is kind of your go-to, very mild uh, steroid, uh, fairly low potency. Um, it's available in lots of different over-the-counter preparations. Um, obviously, you know, you'll see different creams, you'll see ointments, obviously ointments being more or less occlusive than a cream. It's going to be more occlusive, right? It's going to be more greasy, it has better staying power there. Um, and then kind of moving up, you can see your moderate potent, and then you have the very, very potent uh, steroids, clobetazole, which, you know, um, as one of your fellow classmates said, just put clobetazole on everything, and you should be fine, right? <laughs> Don't do that. Um, that's going to be more relegated to very severe disease. Um, that's when you're going to use for those kind of short-term course, courses for exacerbations, and then you kind of back off and either use a, a moderate or a more higher potency one, right? Also notice that different salts of the same steroid can affect its potency, right? So you can certainly see things like, um, just a good example here. I'm trying to find one. So like if you look at hydrocortisone, it uh, falls into the medium category. If you look in the more potent one, you can see hydrocortisone butyrate. So it's a different salt form of that um, that is a higher potency. It's able to either be absorbed uh, more effectively, uh, whatever it happens to be, but it's all related to the salt. So just be aware, um, usually hydrocortisone acetate is usually the, the very common one you'll see. Um, but certainly you can see valerate, butyrate, all kinds of different salts that are available there. So um, I'm not gonna put on a test question to say like, okay, is uh, betamethasone a moderate, potent, or very potent steroid? Like, I don't really care that you guys know that necessarily. I expect you guys to look this up um, if you need to uh, find that information. Just be aware that there's different potencies and that what those ramifications are for patients using it. So realize that um, what the side effect profile might look like for a high potency steroid versus something more mild, right? That makes sense? Okay. So some other things we can use uh, would be some topical immunomodulators. So if patients could not receive uh, topical steroids for whatever reason, these are two other agents that can be useful. So they might not be um, nearly as potent as some of your higher potency steroids, but they can be useful for uh, to decrease this immune reaction. Uh, two of the ones uh, you'll see here are going to be tacrolimus and pimecrolimus. Uh, tacrolimus you might also see being used systemically as a uh, an immunosuppressant for patients who have, say, like transplants um, or other uh, immune conditions, but very frequently you'll see it uh, to help prevent like graft versus host disease after uh, transplant. 
So um, again, their mechanism, they're working to help inhibit the activation of T cells. You're going to see decreased mast cell activity and also decreased activity of these keratinocytes. Um, they do worry about um, some possible increased risk for cancer risk, although I think it's pretty, pretty, uh, pretty mild. Um, so these, this is why you'll typically see these guys being used as kind of secondary agents if they cannot receive steroids. Um, Again, if you have patients who have already weakened immune systems, you may want to avoid this because you will have some systemic effects. Um, again, it's all going to be related to the surface area of the body you're covering um, when, in the occlusiveness of it. Uh, skin irritation is really the biggest adverse effect. Uh, and they will be a little bit more photosensitive, so make sure they're using high SPF uh, sunscreen uh, when they go out in the sun. For um, more severe exacerbations, you could potentially utilize oral corticosteroids. Um, again, you sometimes used for short courses during exacerbations. They do provide pretty rapid relief compared to in, in comparison to a lot of your topical products. Um, and if you are going to be on it for, say, more than a week, you would need to have a tapering built in. Otherwise, you will see uh, that pretty significant adrenal suppression that occurs there. And also, by tapering the dose, you also can prevent that flare-up that we talked about previously. Um, you know, due to suppressing the immune system, you take that away, and all of a sudden you can see a, a flare-up of the inflammation. So by tapering that dose, um, you allow the patient to kind of get back down to their baseline a little bit more gently. Okay, so some other topical antibiotics you might see being used out there. Uh, one's going to be bacitracin. Um, certainly this is a good, very broad coverage antibacterial. Uh, we don't use it systemically because it has a lot of uh, systemic side effects, but since it doesn't get absorbed when used topically, it's a great drug to use um, for topical uh, either infection prevention or treatment. Um, very frequently you'll see it used in combination with things like neomycin or polymyxin B. Uh, so you see like double antibiotic ointment, typically like bacitracin and, and neomycin or uh, polymyxin B by itself. And then uh, if you have triple antibiotic ointment or neosporin, you'll see all three of those together. Uh, so it's very frequently how you'll see those being, uh, being termed. Um, again, no systemic toxicity, but some patients may have an allergic reaction to some of the carriers uh, and, and the, the actual vehicle itself, so be, just be aware of that. Nupirsin is a drug you'll see being used very frequently to treat, uh, especially carriage of MRSA. Um, so a lot of times when patients are coming into the hospital, they'll do kind of a nasal swab for MRSA to see if they're carriers or not. And then if they are, then they'll actually use Bactroban or Nupirsin in order to help treat that. Um, it's working by inhibiting uh, the tRNA uh, and preventing protein synthesis. So it works kind of similarly, uh, just at a different step uh, to prevent protein synthesis from some of our other antibiotics. Um, and again, this one is good because it's not absorbed uh, systemically. So again, it's good for topical use, uh, but may cause some mucous membrane irritation, especially if you're applying it you know, around the nares. Uh, and a lot of this is related to the vehicle that it's in. And it contains a polyethylene glycol. Uh, next, we'll have polymyxin B. We kind of mentioned this previously. Uh, again, it has another, um, you know, we talked about polymyxins um, as being very, very potent antibacterial agents, but what were some of the problems when we used it systemically? Ototoxicity renal toxicity, and also just seeing S toxicity as well. Um, so very, very uh, nasty drugs when used systemically, but again, topically, they're fine because they don't really get a lot of uh, systemic absorption. Um, rarely you're gonna see allergic reactions uh, to this one. So again, if you see it, and that's kind of the problem when you use like triple antibiotic products because um, it'll contain three drugs, and if they have a reaction, you're not really sure if it was one of the drugs or the vehicle or what it happens to be, but usually probably makes some B is not uh, generally the culprit here. Um, you can run the risk for toxicity if you're using this in large areas of say wound uh, tissue, denuded skin, anything like that. You run the risk of having systemic absorption, but this is a pretty rare case, and I wouldn't expect to see this very often clinically. Think about like your, um, surgical ICU patients who are in like a serious like motor vehicle collision or something like that, those would be the patients you'd be a little bit more worried about for those kind of type of cases. And then uh, sometimes you'll see aminoglycosides being used as well, so neomycin fall in this category along with gentamicin. Anyone know where you see gentamicin topically being used most frequently? Eyes Yeah, usually for neonates when they're uh, first born, you'll put it on the eyes, what does that do? Um, not necessarily STDs necessarily, but just um, uh, lots of different bacteria that could be in the in the birth canal uh, from affecting the baby. So you, you'll see them typically get a dose of gentamicin rubbed on the eyes. Um, I forgot about that when my baby was born uh, a few months ago, and so when I saw that gunk on her eyes, I was like, oh gosh, what's going on with her? And then I was like, oh wait, okay, just gentamicin, that's fine. Um, no eye infections though, so it was good. Um, 
So again, with, the, with neomycin, you can sometimes have some systemic accumulation. Uh, clinically, this is not uh, all that uh, relevant very frequently. Um, neomycin, though, can cause some sensitization. So like I said, if you're using a triple antibiotic ointment uh, that had neomycin in it, um, this is more likely to cause allergic reactions than you would see with some of the other drugs like bacitracin or polymyxin. So just be aware, that neomycin, a little bit higher likelihood for having um, some allergic reaction to that. Next, we'll talk a little bit about, about some topical antifungal therapy. So certainly you can see lots of different azole antifungals. We kind of mentioned these uh, previously, but we'll just kind of uh, go over this again. Um, this will include agents like clotrimazole, ketoconazole, myconazole, lots of different topical antifungal products. Um, remember, they're all going to be working by inhibiting that fungal CYP450 that is responsible for putting together their cell wall. Uh, you know, again, we saw a lot of drug interactions when used systemically. You avoid a lot of that here with topical products. Um, you'll see it used for both topical and vaginal uses. So again, you can frequently see um, different preparations that are kind of more formulated for one versus the other. Um, the thing you'll see with um, these drugs is that for fungal infections, especially with things like um, you know nail infections and things like that, that therapy is going to have to be typically pretty prolonged. Um, so here you can see two to three weeks, especially for like certain uh, like oncomycoses and things like that. You can certainly see um, very long therapy, very frequent failures uh, of this therapy. So that's why they're very difficult to treat because uh, it's hard to penetrate and get to um, really to affect the, the fungus growing there. Um, you have cyclopyrox or Penlac. This is another common one you might see being used, especially uh, since I believe it's available over the counter. Um, this one is inhibiting uptake of certain uh, molecular precursors to help produce the, the fungal cell wall. So a little different mechanism there, but still working against that cell wall. Um, here you can see it for um, lots of different fungal uh, skin infections. And um, the one you'll see that pin lac is a, is a nail lacquer. You'll actually put on the nail itself, um, fingers, toenails, and, and again, very infrequently is it effective, say less than 12%, but it's a common over-the-counter product people at least try. Um, you also have some allylamine, so you have like naphtaphene, uh, terbenafine. Um, these are going to be working by inhibiting um, products of things like ergosterol um, uh, in the actual fungal cell wall. Again, um, varying degrees of, of efficacy here, maybe some local irritation, but nothing um, else to really write home about. Um, you have tolnaftate as well. Um, again, a lot of times you're going to see this has a uh, very long-term therapy in order to help prevent recurrence of all these fungal infections. Um, this one doesn't actually have any candle activity candidal activity, um, so there's one notable hole there in its uh, coverage. And then um, Nystatin is going to be another drug, again, good for uh, candidal infections. This one, again, you'll frequently see e either being used cutaneously or um, um, orally, because again, it doesn't have good systemic absorption, so this is another good drug you can use um, for treating things like thrush infections and whatnot. Okay, and just a few topical antivirals you might see being used occasionally. Um, here you have things like acyclovir and pencyclovir. We talked about these previously as being uh, synthetic guanine analogs that help prevent uh, production of new viral DNA. Um, you'll see these being utilized against usually herpes virus, so simplex 1 and 2, those will be effective against. And you may see them being used for uh, oral label herpes uh, simplex infections. Um, again, nothing uh, too significant as far as side effects go. And then one new drug uh, we haven't mentioned before is going to be this Amiquamod or Aldera. Um, this one is uh, an antiviral uh, immunomodulator. And so essentially what it does, it actually helps to stimulate the patient's own immune system. Um, so it's going to help to stimulate these, uh, these uh, PMN cells, uh, increase the release of things like interferon alpha, stimulates macrophages uh, to help produce new interleukins, things like that. Uh, and you can actually see these being utilized for external and perianal warts. Um, you know, basal cell carcinoma is another indication there. Um, and this one is... Um, interesting because, again, you're increasing inflammation on purpose in order to help deal with these viruses. Um, so, again, you can see things like, you know, vesicles or uh, ulcers formation uh, occurring, and all of it's going to be related to that inflammation that it's inducing, which is also how e efficacious it's going to be. So, uh, the more inflammation you have, the more effective the drug is actually being, but, again, more side effects you're going to be seeing with that drug. So, anyone know what one of the most effective treatments for uh, warts actually is? It's non-drug. You can freeze it. What's another common thing people have at their house? Duct tape. Yeah, duct tape is actually another good one. There's a, I was doing a, um, an over-the-counter like herbal remedies talk one time, and uh, I was looking at some studies that are actually comparing things like salicylic acid versus uh, duct tape versus kind of over-the-counter freezing methods, and the duct tape worked just as well uh, for that, interestingly enough. So duct tape can really fix anything. 
yeah, basically you just put it on there, leave it on for a couple hours, and you can remove it. Um, it helps to break down the, the wart tissue, and yeah. Who knew, right? Anyway, so any questions on the dermatology stuff? So since we just went over, I probably won't cover it for the review, but uh, next we'll hit the review.